All right, so the text of Psalm 51. To the leader, a Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. But you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. God's word for God's people. All right, so uh, similar to how we've been going about this, Psalm 51 situated in book number two, which is Psalms 42 to 72. This Psalm, uh, similar to the Psalm last week, Psalm 30, also has a superscription or title, which is uh, this right here, to the leader, a Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So this to the leader um, is um, to the musical leader, kind of like the choir director, if you will. Um, and uh, we'll say a word about uh, the rest of this. The genre is, uh, this particular text is a lament or some call it a complaint song or a complaint song. And it is one of an individual. Um, there's a, there's another kind of lament, which we'll look at, um, next week. Tonight is, is this individual lament, or some call this, uh, an individual prayer for help. This right here, the lament, and specifically the individual lament, this is the psalm, the, the type of psalm, the type of genre that makes up the most of the psalm. So out of the 150, the genre that is the most prevalent is the, the genre of lament, and in particular, the individual lament or the individual complaint song. Last week, um, I referenced lament when I, I said that uh, this gentleman, uh, Tremper, Tremper Longman, the scholar, 
who wrote a book, uh, How to Read the Psalm, says in there that uh, that the the Thanksgiving uh, hymn or the Thanksgiving psalm is um, is God is the um, is the speakers or the psalmist. Um, the reason for thanks is the the God's um, the answered prayer from the lament. Okay, which again we'll kind of we'll spell out tonight. Hopefully, it'll better we'll have better understanding. And in particular, to this, you you also heard me talk about us what I call sub genres. And this particular psalm, in addition to being an individual lament, is what I'm gonna call a sub genre. That being a penitential psalm, penitential psalm. Okay. So regarding regarding uh, what we want to do tonight, just two simple goals for this lesson. One, we want to gain understanding about the genre of lament, and we want to consider how Psalm 51 can help us in our prayer life. Those are our two goals for tonight. Now, this idea about penitential psalms, this might be new for some of you. There are seven penitential psalms, Psalm 6, 32, 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. Okay, these are the seven penitential psalms, and these are uh, called penitential psalms only in the Christian tradition. So what do I mean by that? Um, so um, as I talked about the, um, the Protestant Bible, the Bible that Christians read, which is the Old and New Testament or, or the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, our, our Jewish um, friends also read um, the Hebrew Bible or what you and I know as the Old Testament. They also read the Psalms and use the Psalms in their, uh, their worship and their liturgy but these seven that I've identified are not, uh, they don't refer to them as penitential songs, which is why I say um, it's only in the Christian tradition that, that these are referred to as the pen penitential songs. And this particular one, Psalm 51, is the most well-known uh, penitential psalm. These psalms were used liturgically, meaning they're used in Christian worship in early Christian times and later in the Middle Ages. The Book of Common Prayer, which is the official service book of the Church of England. Um, the uh, Church of England is basically this forerunner to um, the modern day um, Anglican communion, which is um, the um, Anglican communion is the, um, I believe it's the second or third largest um, of um, Christian tradition in the world um, behind Roman Catholicism and another one. Um, so when the Church of England, you know, we, we uh, recently dealt with the death of the queen um, and, um, if you watched any of that and, you know, her service, it, it was in the tradition of the Anglican church. John Wesley, the father of Methodism was a member of the church of England. What you and I know as the Episcopal church, uh, if you're Episcopalian in the United States, you're an Anglican. They are, our Episcopal brothers and sisters use the book of common, common prayer. Bishop Desmond Tutu. He was an Anglican, okay, and so, um, and so, think of the Book of Common Prayer as um, kind of their, not entirely, but to some degree, um, kind of like um, the Book of Ritual. It has, um, you know, orders of worship, but it also has prayers, um, and it's been around for you know uh, a long time. Um, the Book of Common Prayer appoints these seven penitential psalms as the proper psalms for Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of the season of Lent. 
um, which is a generally usually a, a, a season in the Christian tradition that, um, you know, we, we focus on repentance and, you know, sin. And so, you know, it's proper for these um, in their themes in these Psalms, you know, it, it's proper for them to be used. Pope Innocent III, who was a Pope during the Middle, middle Ages, he was the Pope um, from 1198 to 1216 Common Era or um, AD. He was the one who ordered these psalms to be prayed during Lent. And so on uh, in certain services or on uh, the seven Fridays in Lent, these seven psalms were prayed by folks within the church. Okay. So a little bit of background and you know, understanding of penitential psalms. Um, okay, so as we move now to this superscription, a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. This superscription references three people, David, Nathan, and Bathsheba, and it also references a particular incident. Um, can anybody, um, you know, share uh, what, um, what they know about the incident um, that revolves around these three personalities? It's just when I think um, David um, had an affair or whatever with Bathsheba. So are you sure about that? Or are you I'm asking? sure. Okay. Uh, you are correct. David did have an affair with Bathsheba. Um, anybody, can anybody uh, recall who Nathan is? So is Nathan, I think Nathan was Bathsheba's husband. And I think he was in a war or in the war. And when Bathsheba got pregnant by David, King David, um, King David help order Nathan to sleep with his wife. And for some reason he didn't. I think this is, I think that's Nathan is the husband. And, that, and then so King David had Nathan ordered to be killed. Okay, so. Is Nathan the husband? I think Nathan's the husband. Um, before I, before I bring up what else is on this slide and share? Is there anyone who wants to who wants to add? Didn't David uh, order uh, Nathan to be put on the front the front of the front line so that he would be killed? Okay, so we uh, we have some slight confusion about personalities here. We got okay. some elements of the story correct. We got <laughs> a little confusion. So I know we, part of it is mine. <laughs> if, if we were to look at if we were to look at Second Samuel eleven, that chapter narrates David's adulterous affair with Bathsheba and the ordering of her husband, whose name is. Uriah the Hittite, uh, his murder. You might recall David uh, goes up on the roof. He sees Bathsheba taking a bath. He orders his servants to bring this woman. He asks, who is that? He orders her to come. He sleeps with her. Later on, she, sa she sends word and said, hey, I'm about to have a baby. And so then Uriah, who was a warrior in David's army, to, you know, David to cover up, you know, his sin. He brings him home. He he's like, hey, go home and in 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 kind of coded language to some degree. He he says, hey, go home and you know, and you know, visit your wife, 
with the hope that he'll lie with her so that then when it comes out she's pregnant, David has cover. Ariah being, you know, the man he is, he's like, I'm not going home and my fellow soldiers are out on the battlefield. So then David orders the commander to put Ariah on the front line where the battle is the most fierce. He ultimately ends up dying. Nathan is the prophet. And when we go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 15, um, David, I mean, excuse me, Nathan goes to King David and he uh, tells him this story about a rich man and a poor man and how the rich man, you know, takes the poor man's lamb. And then David's all upset and he's like, where is this man? Like, you know, let me know because I'm going to send to go get him. And Nathan's like, that man is you. And then David realizes, you know, his sin. He realizes, you know, he's a rich man and, and what he did. Okay. Um, so that this uh, superscription, you know, is, is um, this is, that's the incident that it's referring to. And so, you know, as we, if when we read this and, and we understand that incident, we can, we can see how the, uh, that context in the life of David fits, you know, what is being said in the Psalm. You may remember that I also said that when it comes to the superscriptions, um, sometimes um, they they do reference something particular, but but they can be used in that's not the sole um, situation. So, um, what other life circumstance or circumstances might the context of this psalm apply to? So, if we think about you know this this um, situation in the life of David. And we were to kind of transpose it into our lives or to think about it in, as it relates to our lives. Um, what other context could we apply this, um, this to? And I hope I'm making sense when I'm asking this question. Could it be forgiveness? Okay. Yeah, before we before we get to forgive, why why do we need forgiveness? Because we sin. Or exactly, because we sin. And so even though this this superscription references a a particular um even though this superscription references a particular seen in the life of David, what it in essence boils down to is there's an individual who's in relationship with God, who sinned, and the sin has, you know, ruptured, fractured the relationship with God. Thus, the, the speaker of the psalm stands in need of God's forgiveness, uh, stands in need of repaired relationship with God because of this sin. And, and the sin can be, as, as in this case, it's a, this uh, David's sin was committed against another human being. But you and I know that when we, when we harm someone else, when we sin against someone else, you know, we also sin against God. And there are times when, when our sin may not necessarily, um, you know, um, be in harm of someone else, but we, we go against something that God, you know, one of God's commands. And so thus we do sin against God. So um, individual sins, individual stands in need of forgiveness. And so um, we could, we can, we should be able to apply Psalm 51 to an instance in our in our individual lives when 
we have committed some sin that fractures our relationship with God and therefore requires God's forgiveness. Okay. Um, here goes uh, Tremper Longman again, gentleman who wrote a book, um, wrote a book called How to Read the Psalms. And he, ah, Lord, this is... Um, not what I had on this slide. That is, um, that is incorrect. Um, I apologize. I know I thought I had fixed this. Um, so Tremper Longman, what he actually writes, um, is that the lament is the polar opposite of the hymn on the emotional spectrum. So the hymn, in the hymn, it's it's giving thanks and praise to God for some reason. You know, we, we talked about the tone and how it was joyful. So if the hymn is, is joyful and grateful, the lament is on the opposite end of the emotional spectrum. And what he also says is that this genre of psalm, the lament, is primarily defined by its mood. The lament, he says, is the psalmist's cry when in great distress, the psalmist has nowhere to turn but to God. Furthermore, he suggests that there are um, three kinds of lament, if you will. Um, one in which the psalmist is troubled by his or her own actions or thoughts. Two, the psalmist complains about the actions of others against him or her. Um, oftentimes in the Psalms of Lament, there'll be a, a reference to enemies. Remember last week we, we talked about, you know, he talked about how in, in the, uh, the Thanksgiving hymn, about uh, not letting the foes or the enemies rejoice and we said that the the enemy or the foe in that case was sick sickness you know sickness was was imaged as an enemy or a foe okay and so um and and oftentimes when when we're dealing with these psalms of lament and there's a reference to the enemy very often it's the enemies are um you know, not named. So um, it's hard to determine who or what the the enemy or enemies is or are. Sometimes you can identify them, some, in, but more often than not, we can't. And third, um, the psalmist's frustration with God. So um, there's individual laments, there's communal laments. Um, we'll get to a communal lament next week, but when we're talking about individual lament, it could be the psalmist is troubled by his or her own actions or thoughts, which is the, uh, the case here. Um, you know, the speaker, in this case, if we, you know, use David's situation, he committed, he, he had an affair, he committed adultery, he committed murder. So he's troubled by his own actions, by what he did. Um, the psalmist complains or laments about others' actions against him or her enemies, or the psalmist is upset, is frustrated with God. Oftentimes this can be, you know, the, the psalmist is, uh, you know, is um, dealing with um, feeling um, isolated or forgotten by God, wondering, God, where are you and how long are you going to have me in this situation, okay? And so, um, that's how um, we can, um, that's what uh, the scholar Tremper Longman uh, says about laments, okay? Now, similar to um, when we talked about uh, how hymns have a structure, um, and laments also have a structure to them. Now, let me say that 
we don't always have all the elements that might be laid out. We might find, you know, a few. We might find a handful. We may not find all. We might find all of, all elements of the structure in a particular element. We might not. Okay. So there's some there's some uh, flexibility and some fluidity. And uh, what I want to do is I want to share with you uh, two different people and how they present the structure, um, hoping that one or the other may help uh, may help us to understand um this this genre okay however whoever is uh easier for you to understand um and different people you might find that there'll be some shared shared uh elements they just might say it a little differently so however you understand it is fine so lawrence boat um offers the following structure for laments they often begin with an address to God um, that, that can be um, you know, intimate and personal. Two, there'll be the lament itself. This is where the psalmist brings whatever the complaint is to God. Three, there'll be a confession of trust in God and some petition for relief. Fourth, there'll be and some exclamation of certainty that God has or God will hear the prayer that is being offered. And then five, uh, some vow of praise. This is where the psalmist declares God's praises to the community, to the faithful, or the psalmist vows him or herself to continue to praise God forever. So. Um, this one, and I would say this one, we, we may not be able to find, we probably won't find all the elements that either one of these two will, will list. But when we see this language about, oh God, or oh Lord, um, that you and I, sometimes we talk that way, sometimes we don't use it. It's obviously in prayer. We hear people say, oh God, um, that, that is address language, this oh God or oh Lord. That's address language, okay? Um, so that's one structure, okay? Um, another structure, um, there's a, a, an Old Testament scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann, and uh, he's wrote, you know, countless books. He follows um, a German a scholar named, by the name of Klaus Westermann. He follows Klaus Westermann's structure of lament and Westerman suggests that there are two main parts of a lament or an individual or a prayer for help. And that is the first main part is the plea and the second main part is praise. So if we just, you know, slow down and look at this, when the, when, uh, when this writer, this speaker is asking God to have mercy to blot out transgressions, to wash and to cleanse, um, to purge, to wash, to let the speaker hear joy and gladness, to let the bones rejoice, God, to hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities, to create in me a clean heart, put a new and right spirit with me, to not cast me away from your presence and to not take your Holy Spirit from me to restore uh, the joy of salvation and sustain a willing spirit to deliver from bloodshed. Um, that, that Those are all kind of in the imperative and they all sound like prayer requests. We're, we're requesting, we're asking or demanding from God something. And so that is, you know, this, all of this from like verse one, um, verse one through like 14 kind of can encompass this 
um, the plea because it is the psalmist or the speaker making a request, making an ask, making a demand, okay? And then uh, when we talk about praise, um, you know, in this case, um, still another kind of a request, O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Um, and then down here, you know, um, th again, this one doesn't follow the form, but when we start, when the, the writer starts talking about, um, you know, declaring God's praise, we kind of, in um, God doing good, um, we get elements of praise in this particular lament. So the, the two main uh, elements of the structure based on Westerman are plea and praise. And they can be, you can break them down further in that in the plea section, which is where basically you're at the, the speaker is um is a is putting forth this complaint that God, you need to fix this situation. There's an address to God. So similar to both, they both say that there's an address to God. The complaint, which is um a prayer that characterizes for God how desperate the situation is. A petition where the speaker um, is making this request, asking God to act in a decisive and particular way. Sometimes he says that um, these types of uh, the lament might have motivations. So, in the psalm, there might be a motivation. The person might be um, might put forth motivation for God to act. It may sound like what you and I call bargaining. So, last week, um, in the um, in Psalm thirty, the the writer put forth this uh, question: Will will the dust praise you? In essence, you know. When people die and go to the pit, when they are turned back to dust, they can't, that, that mouth is closed. That mouth can't, can't speak your praise. And so it was, it sounded like bargaining um, and they call it motivation for God to act. So if we were to look at various um, laments, we might see uh, from as motivation the speaker might say, God, I'm innocent. I ain't done nothing wrong. And these folk are attacking me. The speaker might uh, be guilty. God, I'm guilty. You know, I'm putting myself on the mercy of God's court. The speaker might recall God's goodness. Um, you know, God, you are good back here. So I'm trusting you'll be good right now, that you'll show your goodness in my situation right now. The speaker might remind God that that he or she is is um is valued by God, and therefore, because I'm valued, God, you should then act. Or they might appeal to God to consider God's power or reputation. So, you know, this is um where the writer is saying, um, you know. God, in essence, you should do this because of your holy name or because um, sometimes uh, name can also be another word for reputation or because, God, you're powerful, you should do this, okay? So um, we might find in the lament um, the right, the speaker giving God, laying forth uh, reasons or motivation for God to act. We might find, it's not in this one, we might find imprecation. You heard me talk about Psalms of imprecation. And that is where the speaker has this voice of resentment and vengeance that won't be satisfied until God retaliates against those who've done wrong. So in essence, um, you know, Psalm 137, I referenced that and it talks about, you know, children being dashed against rocks. You know, so, you know, 
Um, it's almost, this is my language, they don't say it, but it's almost like the speaker in the psalmist is, um, and hope y'all won't, you know, be offended when I say this, kind of um, sicking God on the, the folks or the person who has done the psalmist wrong. Like, in essence, God, get them. Get this person for what they did. That is imprecation, okay? Then when we go to the second main part, we move from the plea to the praise. Um, the plea is about desperation. The, pra the praise moves from this desperation and now it's replaced by joy, gratitude, and well-being. And very often, not so much in this particular one, but, but sometimes it, it's like this, this quick move where, you know, for so many verses, it was nothing but, you know, doom, gloom, darkness. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's this, you know, yet I will praise the Lord or, you know, yet I'll be confident that, you know, that I'll see the salvation of God. And it's like, well, where did it, where did this come from? This, um, this move from the plea to the praise can, can often be surprising or kind of uh, very quick in its shift. And, and if we were to look at some other laments, we would see this to be the case. And then uh, there is a uh, payment of vows, okay? And this simply is, um, you know, when the, when the writer, speaker was in trouble, whatever that trouble was, they vowed to give or to pay something, usually a sacrifice as an offering of thanksgiving. And now, um, and now they will honor the vow, okay? Because God has acted or because God will act. And then finally, in this praise um, section, uh, there's doxology and praise where God is acknowledged as being faithful. God is acknowledged as saving. In other words, the speaker, uh, deems God worthy of praise, okay? And so um, I know that that's a lot that's probably new for you, for most, if not all of you. Um, when you get these notes, you can, you know, look at this and refer to this. So um, again, and, and if we were to look at some other ones, we would be able to identify these parts um, a little more clearly than we can in Psalm 51. But generally speaking, this is how we are able to identify a lament or a complaint psalm uh, or prayer, um, an individual who's praying for help. Let me pause to ask if anybody has any questions about anything I've said thus far. Okay, hearing none, moving on. All right, so um, we're going to kind of get into the text now. So um, an object that's mentioned that we might not be familiar with is kiss up. Verse seven, the writer makes this request for God to purge, purge the person with kiss up and I shall be clean. Kiss up. A small leafy shrub used in rituals for ceremonial cleansing and purification and atonement. It was used in connection with the Passover, the cleansing of leopards, and the sacrifice of the red heifer. And it was suited suited for use as a brush, if you will. Um, you will call during Passover. The Lord said, "You know, sprinkle some blood." from the animal that was sacrificed on the door, on the doorposts of your home. When I see the blood, I will pass by you. So they would, you know, um, take this uh, hyssop branch and have it, you know, blood on it, dip it in the blood and then kind of use it, if you will, like a paintbrush and to put this, put this on there. But it's, is this reference, it's, it's used during kind of cleansing and purification. 
atonement is this word that we're atoning for sin. And so it, it conjures, uh, this word hyssop, it conjures up this, this meaning and this identification of, of needing to be cleansed, needing to be purified, um, and, and needing to be atoned for something, okay, uh, a sin. Likewise, um, we, last week we talked about, you know, um, the, the writer said, don't hide your face. In this case, the writer says, hide your face. Um, when God, when it's in the context of sin, when God hides God's face from sin, it is considered a great act. So if God in other contexts hides his face, is rejection, is God's, um, you know, kind of turning away. You don't want God to turn God's face from you to pull, withdraw God's presence. But when it comes to sin, we do want God, you know, you want God to hide your face. In this case, the writer does want God to hide his face. So a couple of cultural um, concepts that we want to be able to understand. Likewise, this psalm has some key terms, key words that show up repeatedly. And so you hopefully will remember that when um, I said that when we're reading this and we see words that show up multiple times, that's often a clue about the theme of the song, about, about the message, the kind of that the writer is intending to convey. So there are a couple of words that show up multiple times. Um, one being the Hebrew word pesha, which is translated transgression or transgressor. Verse one, right there. Verse three, I know my transgressions. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressions, okay? Um, avon, which is iniquity, shows up verse two and verse nine. Um, hata or hatat, um, which is sin, sins or sinner. Uh, you see the verses where it shows up there. Uh, maha, which is blot out, verse two and verse nine. A hair, which is cleanse or clean, verse 2, verse 7, verse 10. And kavas, which is wash, verse 2 and verse 7. Now, let me um, put some meaning to these words so we kind of get a better understanding. So when we talk about Pesha, uh, transgressions, it means to rebel against authority or it is means offense or fall. What is contrary to human or divine standard or to transgress a relationship? So we all know that God has a standard, right? Um, in terms of how God desires for God's people to behave. And when we uh when we go against that standard, we can be said to transgress or patch up. Avon has this basic meaning of being uh, to bend, to curve, or to twist. So when we, um, is this word for iniquity, and when we talk about that, um, it can generally mean um, kind of this crookedness, which you heard me use when I preached one of the Psalms a few weeks back. Um, I said that um, someone has said that God is the only one who can write straight on a crooked line, that, that there is, Humans have a uh, tensity, propensity to be crooked. We, 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 um, you know, we can uh, pervert or to twist our ways when we sin, right? But there's, there's, um, there's a twisted um, tendencies within human beings. Likewise, hatat is simply to fall short or to miss a mark or a goal. So um, it, there are three different words, pesha, transgress, avon, iniquity, hatat, or hatat sin. Three different words when, we show, when they show up in English that are translated differently, but they, they in essence all refer to the idea of sin. And so as many times as you saw 
um, where these three words showed up in these, you know, um, variety of verses, it all basically deals with this idea of sin. And so um, poetically dealing with this idea of sin and using different words basically to kind of convey this idea. Okay. Um, maha means um, this word blot out means to destroy, to obliterate, to remove from existence or to wash off, um, removing impurities by way of water, i.e. when you and I, if we've, if we've uh, been out in the hot sun working all day in the summertime, we sweat, um, you know, we, we smell and we take a shower to wash off, to cleanse ourselves from the, 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 you know, the, the stink of the sweat and from, you know, if we if we were out in the garden and we got dirt on our hands or dirt on us, you know, or, you know, if you're a person who works in a certain a certain industry, like maybe you're a mechanic and you get oil on you or you get car fluids, you know, right? You need to take a shower to wash off the 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 dirt, the impurities. Uh, similarly, uh, to hair, to cleanse or to clean means to purify or to be restored. Um, I think about it this way. Um, I have uh, leather shoes. And when, when I wear the leather shoes for so many times, the, the, the shine, it goes away, it fades away. And so I have to shine the shoes to restore the shine on the shoes so that they look, they look like new. And so, you know, the shoe was in a, a shiny state, a new state. And then when you wear it over a long course of time, it, it fades. And so I, I need to do something to restore it back to that state. Uh, hence, um, this idea of being cleansed or clean um, to, purif to, be or to purify myself or to be purified or to be restored back to a prior state. And then finally, to uh, to kibas is is this idea about washing garments, and so when this when the writer, when the speaker uses this word "wash me" in verse two, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and to um, to wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. The right the speaker is using this word that people would normally use when they're talking about washing clothes. Um, they um, they obviously didn't have washing machines. And so how they would wash clothes, they would put the clothes in a tub and then they would use their feet and they would, you know, stomp the clothes in the water along with some cleansing agent um, that would be equivalent to our soap or our, uh, our um, tithe or gain, whatever it is that you use, whatever cleaning agent you use to to get the clothes clean, to get the dirt off. Um, he's using the idea of, in essence, um, putting a dirty garment into the, the wash basin along with the cleansing agent and, and stomping it to get it to get it clean. And so, um, so all these, these words, um, you know, further along this, this idea of, you know, of what sin is like and what what um people who sin and in this case the speaker what what the request is of God in the midst of the sin okay so in essence the writer has said you know by committing this act that I've committed God um my sin has fractured our relationship because I've done something that went contrary to your standard. I need you to, to wash me from my sin. So in essence, when, when we hear that language, it, it conveys this idea that um, what the hymn writer said, sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it uh, white as snow. And so um, 
this idea of of um, of of needing to have the stain of sin removed. Likewise, to say, God, I've fallen short of your mark. You had a mark. You. Um, it also uh, kind of think about it this way. Um, you know anything about archery? You the the sh the person who shoots pulls the bow with the arrow and shoots the arrow to try to hit the bullseye, try to hit the target. And so when you when you don't hit the bullseye, you miss you miss the mark, you miss the target. That's what you're going for. And so it's kind of like this idea. So God, I've missed the intended target. Uh, miss the, the target that you laid out for how you desired for me to conduct myself. So now what am I asked? What is the, the, the one who finds himself the speaker as saying, God, to blot out my transgressions, God, um, destroy my sin from your memory. Blot out my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions is this is in essence the request for forgiveness. Um, you know, we talk. If you've ever heard preachers talk about how God, you know, uh, throws your sin into the sea of forgetfulness, God doesn't remember it. It's this idea of of uh, because of what God can do and God being the only one who can do it, God, remove this, uh, destroy it from your memory, obliterate, blot out, and therefore to be purified, to be restored, cleansed from the sin. What I did left this stain on me, then left this stain on my life. God, now I need you to purify me from this. I need you to restore me from this impure state back to the state where I was, to, to the state prior to when I had this stain on my life. And likewise, to be, to be washed, uh, to be washed from iniquity, to be washed, and I'll be uh, wider than snow, as this one says, um, and that is this idea again, dealing with this um, sin, sin has put a stain on my life. I need God, I need for you to, to launder my life. Put, put, me, uh, put me in your washing machine, if you will, God, and put, put your tide on me, which in our case would, is, is, the, is the work in the blood of Jesus, God, uh, so I heard a preacher once say, Jesus is God's tithe. I've sinned, God, I've fractured our relationship and this sin has left this stain on my life. I need you to put me in your washing machine and to wash my life so that I'll be clean, okay? Um, poetic language, and in and, and conveying these these ideas okay let me pause now to ask anybody have any questions pastor can i ask uh, uh, about uh verse five um where, where it says he was born or we were born with sin, is there some explanation that is different from what is actually seeing or what I'm reading? So, what 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 version of the Bible are you reading from? Oh, it's the same thing. Indeed, I was born guilty of sinner when my mother conceived me. Okay, so so what's your question? The question is, I'm thinking that we're born with sin i'm just trying to find out is is it another is this is that trying to say something to to us or is that trying to say something i should say to me because i didn't um think you were born with saint with sin 
Okay. It's just saying that we we are born in sin, that we're born into sin, not that we are sinners. We were born, we were sinners. We're being born, we're born in a simple world, or I guess like you came into the world and, and it was already simple. It was right. And I'm thinking also, I thought too, uh, a lot of us could have been born because of sin, but is it, it's not saying that the person that was born or the was already had sin. That's what I'm trying to get understanding. It doesn't mean that a uh, person born with saint would sin. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. So um it does it does not mean that that we're uh born born be, it doesn't mean we're born because of sin that's not what uh what this verse is suggesting um the verse um let me just sec so in essence um that this person or that generally speaking um i'm in essence a sinner so um um when we talk about what what Paul says in terms of how how all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, um, you know, no no human being is um, is is perfect. No human being can be you know can can have it said of them that they have not sinned, and so. Um, in a poetic way, this this person is saying, in essence, I'm a, I'm a sinner. Okay, uh, don't don't necessarily read so much and say, you know, um, that baby baby sin, right? That, that's not necessarily what he's saying. Um, even though you know he talks about mother conceiving you know so this idea obviously the person was born um born a, a baby so to speak and he you know the person grew up but um not that again when when he was a baby he did something but it's a poetic way of saying that um that in essence he he or she is a sinner Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else have any questions up to this point? No other questions, okay. Um, okay. So let me say a few words about just a few words about this, and I'll say a few more uh, before we get to a couple questions. Um, in this case, you know, you heard me talk about how sometimes the, um, the the psalmist in the lament can refer to enemies, you know, those who are some others. In this case, there's no other. As we already said, the speaker's relationship with God has been fractured by sin. The speaker prays for God's grace, not because grace is deserved, but according to God's steadfast love and compassion. That's verse one. Have mercy on me according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Um, that's, you know, the, that's why I'm appealing because I know that uh, God is a God of steadfast love, unfailing love, and, and 
you know, overflowing mercy. And then simply that God can, is the only one who can restore this relationship that has now been fractured. Uh, let's go to a couple of questions that we, um, that we, you know, I said, we'll kind of consider every week. What's the tone of the speaker in this poem? I think it's a tone of remorse. A hey, remorse? Anybody else? What, what's the tone of the speaker in this poem? I agree with Kim. He's he's looking for forgiveness. Okay. And remorseful for what he he did. Okay. Remorse. Okay. What instances of parallelism? Can you identify in the text? So remember, parallelism, parallelism is this idea where um, the speaker wants to convey the same idea and says it in slightly different ways. So can, can anybody in, identify any um, parallelism in, in this, in Psalm 51? Is it that, is it verse three? For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Um, against you, you alone, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Uh, oh, can you scroll that with me? Hold on. It's right here. Okay, here we go. Wait a minute. Um, I, I, verse three and um, part of verse four. I'm okay. I'm thinking it could be some parallelism in there. Okay. Anyone else? What instances of parallelism can you identify? What about the um the ending of verse one? Blot out my transgressions. And then verse three, for I know my transgressions. So those don't necessarily say the same thing. I, I see how you want to connect those because of the word. The one is saying, God, okay, I got it. you do this. And the and other, the other is saying, one. like, what, what I've done is, is always on my mind, right? I, I always see it. I, I'm, I'm thinking about it. So um, not necessarily the same there. Okay, I got you. Anybody else? Can you identify instances of parallelism? Can we, um, okay, it says to blot out my transgressions transgressions or sins wash me thoroughly from my iniquity iniquities or sin also okay um i see how you want to you want to make that connection you are you are driving the train uh toward the Backwards. right track no you're, you're oh. driving the train toward the right track oh you you are you are so close in the ballpark. <laughs> okay, so let me let me share with you all uh, this. So we look at verse two. So is it two and three, like hold, Sister hold, Kim said? Hold, hold on a minute. Hold on. Okay. Hold, slow down. Verse two: Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So. I already told you all that iniquity is basically another way, another word of saying sin. So you got wash and cleanse, two different words, but in essence, it's the same thing. It's about washing and cleansing is about something that's dirty and, and needing to be 
made clean or purified, you know, zoom away. So you got wash me, uh, cleanse me, iniquity, my sin. Verse seven, purge me with hyssop, hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, same thing, or the same kind of same idea as purge me, not, you know, hyssop is the is the uh, means of purging wash me the 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 cleansing is with water and i shall be whiter than snow and i shall be clean so um we know that um is you know this is this uh this is poetic language hopefully that should sound familiar i, I already mentioned one hymn writer who says that there's another hymn that, has, uh, that says, um, let's see. Um, Kirk Franklin sing that song, Why Did This Snow? I know, I ain't talking about Kirk Franklin. I'm talking <laughs> about the hymns of the church. Um, have thine own way, Lord. Uh, wash me, uh, wash me just now. Uh, it's, um, I know it's in there and it escapes me. Um, because it because it does say whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. If we were to if I were to pull up that that hymn, um, thankfully I got a hymn book on the desk real fast. Um, Is it have thine own way, Lord? Yeah, that's what I was just saying. It's it's have thine own way. Is was uh, that it? Yeah, that's the hymn. Have thine own way. Um, so. It is um, okay. This is verse two and have thine own way. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master the day, brighter than snow, Lord. Wash me just now, as in thy presence, humbly I bow. Okay. Um, it's also this idea. Um um Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it. Why did it? Why did it snow? Why did it snow? Jesus that paid it fun. all. It's also in there. And then I believe uh the hymn writer Fanny Crosby, the one who wrote Pass Me Not and a score of other hymns. Uh it escapes me right now, but I believe she also has a hymn that uh that references this idea about being uh, whiter than snow. So that's what, this is where they got that from. They got it from Psalm 51, okay? Um, and verse 17, uh, the sacrifice acceptable, acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. A broken and contrite heart is the equivalent to a broken spirit. Oh God, you will not despise. So if you don't despise it, that means you it's acceptable to you. It, so the sacrifice sacrifice is acceptable to God. Oh God, you will not despise. Um, might be an, an instance of parallelism here, okay? Um, let me, um, time is getting close. I'm trying to get through this. Um, what images does a psalmist use or what images do the words that the psalm that the psalm writer uses um you know um show up in your mind the image of a heart actually shows up in my mind um talking about giving me a clean heart a heart actually shows up in my mind. Um, also, when they're talking about whiter than snow, I literally see snow, the the the, the white snow. Um, so those images come up in my mind. <laughs> I'm I'm so glad you said uh, you said uh, whiter than snow because we that. I don't think that's probably the most one of the most clear images, if not the most clearest in this text, whiter than snow, because we all know what snow looks like. We know it's white. And so uh, it's not this is uh, it's also kind of metaphorical language because it's not literally talking about snow, but it's about this idea of purity, being clean, 
when you're when you're pure, when you're cleansed, you know, because we know the color white associated with purity. And so in this context of sin and being stained and being washed by God, being cleansed by God, then, you know, I'll, I'll be pure. I'll be like this. OK, so, yeah. All right. Anybody else? What images show up in your mind? What images do you see created by the words of the psalmist? Okay. Um, um, so let me do this. Verse two: Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me. So every time this the speaker is referencing what being washed and being cleansed, I think about taking a shower, taking, um, you know, seeing uh, someone bathing, showering, taking a bath, because that's what you and I know. That's the way that we're, you know, cleansed. Or again, um, if I think about washing and cleaning, doing laundry, putting clothes, again, that's not what this person, he ain't talking about putting clothes in the washer, but, you know, they had a different way of washing clothes. But when I, when I see this language, that's what I think is generated. I put dirty clothes in the washer because they're dirty with whatever, you know, my preferred cleaning agent is with the water and the washing machine, the agitator does the work of cleaning. And so, you know, God's, God's uh, grace and the way God works um, is like the, the cleaning agent the agitator in the water that's, you know, cleaning, getting the clothes clean. Um, Mr. Kim, you were going to say? Okay, so this one isn't about the cleaning, but if you can scroll down, this is just what comes to my mind, like where it says, um, wait, where is it? Where it was talking about hide your face from my sin. Oh, here it is. Verse mm -hmm. nine. nine. Yep. When, when I see that hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities, that, that's a visual image of like, to me, yeah. look away from my sin, put your hand over your face, kind of, so you can't see it. Exactly. Um, hide your face. You know, uh, when you think about the kids playing peekaboo, right? And the person who's playing, you know, they put their hands over their face and then they come up. So yeah, hiding the face. Great. Great, uh, great job. That, that's an image there. Um, we talked about figurative language, metaphor, simile, personifications. Um, because of time, let me go ahead and, and just do share some of this. Uh, verse one, um, uh, blot out my transgressions, right? Um, nothing, well, in a in an inward sense, something is being blotted out. But um, you know, God doesn't have a, a a weapon where something's being destroyed or a marker where something's being you know uh, etched out. Um, or you can kind of think about it this way: um, when we write on when we write on the um, write on the paper with a pencil, you take an eraser and you you erase it right it was it was on the paper but not because you erased it right you kind of think about that about being blotted out verse eight um let the bones that you've crushed rejoice did the person really experience crushed bones no um but it's this idea about when i you know kind of when i sin and you know and i deal with the guilt from the sin and the, the you know uh the, the misery and just, you know, my inward condition and, and how I, you know, hopefully feel um, conviction about my sin by way of the Holy Spirit um, and just the condition of my life, my life feels down. But if God restores and forgives, 
then I, you know, I will rejoice. Um, and uh, verse nine, again, um, God doesn't literally have a face, but, you know, we, we use this language about the face of God. And so, um, you know, putting this again, human like characteristic um, on the God with this expression. And when we talk about, hopefully, when we talk about themes with the with the constant use of the words, the various words for sin, we, we hopefully should be able to identify that as a theme and this wash and cleanse about this need for being, uh, you know, purified, restored, um, having this kind of stain removed, um, you know, which is what God's grace and forgiveness um, does for us. So um, real quickly, say this. I'll wait till we get here. So let me ask you this question. What verse or verses might you use oops, um, if you if you sin, whatever that whatever that is, you know, what verse or verses in the text might if you were to literally you you know, as a result of having spent tonight in this session, you the next time you sin, you know, you think you think about Psalm 51, you remind, okay, Psalm 51 is that Psalm that for when I sin. So if you were, if, if the spirit brought to your remembrance Psalm 51, what verse or, mer or verses might you, if you were to literally just use a verse and pray it, might you use to pray when, during an instance of sin? I would do one and two. All right, one and two. We could definitely pray pray those two. We could literally open up the Bible or open up our app and in the, in the course of our prayer, use those two verses. That's our request. God, have, have mercy on me according to your steadfast love, your grace to your, you know, abundant mercy. God, blot out my transgressions. Please wash me from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. We could, however we choose to do that, great. Verse one and two, anybody else, what verse or verses might you use in your prayer um, when you've sinned? Well, along with that, when she said one and two, I'd use that one. And then I would use verse three and um, four because a part of asking for forgiveness to me is that you have to admit that you, you know, you've done wrong. You're asking for forgiveness. And so for verse three, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. That is my acknowledgement that I know what I've done wrong. I know exactly what I've done wrong. And, you know, when I was reading uh, this psalm before, you know, studying it before tonight, and when I got to, to verse four, um, you know, it really says something to me when it said, against you, you alone have I sinned. So, you know, I really thought about that. Like when, when, you, when I'm sinning, it's against God. It really is against God. So um, just to be able to acknowledge one, two, three, and the top of four. Okay. Anybody else? What verse of verses might you use um, in your prayer? I like uh, I would like Valerie the one and two and the three, and all the right. third verse. Mm -hmm. Okay, and all Sister right. Kim's third verse. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So, um, do I hear somebody else gonna speak? Two, three, and four. Two, three, and four. All right. So, if you were on earlier, just real quick, you heard me play the song that you know. I'm sure. I hope we've all heard. Give me a clean heart. Um, that's, you know, this very short, you know, powerful song. And that person literally, uh, um, Doris Akers wrote that hymn. She got it from right here. Give me a clean heart 
and I'll serve you. So, you know, we can rec we can rec we can pray and recognize our sin, you know, ask God to have mercy, but then, you know, God create give me a clean heart. Right? Don't um you can 10, 11 and 12 tend to be, you know, um popular about, you know, restoration and um you know, joy, restored joy, um, and, you know, uh, this um, proper disposition on the inward, inwardly that, you know, relates to outward action, okay? Um, also, uh, you heard me talk about Psalms, they, they put forth, um, I, you know, ideas, elements of God's character. So what part of God's character that's referenced in this psalm can give us hope or confidence in our prayer, particularly when we do sin, because I'll just speak for me. There have been instances in my life um, when I have sinned and I have not wanted to, you know, come to God and pray. I've not felt like praying, but the text, you know, um invites us to do otherwise and so what element of god's character shows up in here that gives you hope or confidence in prayer Verse six, you desire truth in the inward being. Okay, so how does how does that give you hope or confidence in your prayer? Well, if I if I tell the truth, God will teach me, give me the wisdom. Okay. All right. All right. Anybody else? What? What element of God's character in this psalm um, gives you hope or confidence for your prayer life? What about verse one? And what, it, what in verse one? Where um, it says, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, meaning that in spite of my sinfulness, he still loves me and he still shows compassion for me, even in my sinful ways. All right. Um, I think verse one definitely highlights uh, one of the greatest elements of God's character in that um, you know, um, God's grace and mercy. And so um, we and others rely on God's love, grace, and mercy. And so the, this writer appeals to that, uh, that, uh, that character of God. God is gracious. God is a God of unfailing love. God is his God of overflowing mercy or compassion. And so uh, that element, um, as one says, um, this Psalm 51 demonstrates the power of God's steadfast love and grace on which the prayer, the one praying, is so dependent. Yep. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, I have one. It's verse, um, it's verse 17. Okay. So when it talks about um, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. So to me, that gives me hope because if I've sinned and I'm coming with a broken feeling, a brokenness, and my heart is, 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 is broken, that that's what God actually wants. And that's what he's going to accept. It's nothing else I can do but come to him with my brokenness right. to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. So it's all right to feel broken. Okay. 
All right. Psalm 51 offers us a blueprint for the confession of our sins. And in, and in essence, suggests to us that there is no, there's no sin, no matter how vile, um, that cannot be blotted out by God's steadfast love and mercy. Um, it teaches us the importance of naming sin and sin, taking responsibility for our own actions, and learning from our iniquity, and it demonstrates the power of God's steadfast love and grace upon which those who pray rely. Uh, it says also that God is the only one who can restore our relationship. And um, this word create real quickly, um, human, you and I can create things, right? If you, if you are the one who knits or sews or you do crocheting, you can create blankets, right? Um, those who um, are in the tech space, someone had the mind, they created an iPhone, they created a computer. You know, human beings create all these uh, inventions and things. God also creates, go back, when we go back to Genesis, God, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. There are some things that you and I can create, and there are some things that only God can create. And the word that's translated, created here, it's the word that in, in which only God can create. Only God is the one who can, um, you know, fix and create um, this, this clean or this pure heart within, okay? Um, this, um, the, the use of these uh, various words also for clean, cleanse, wash, um, demonstrate the completeness of God's act of forgiveness and that the one is asking to be clean both outside and on the inside and that no trace of sin remains. That, that um, God can cleanse from sin and guilt permanently and that sins can be annihilated only by God's grace and steadfast love. And one person suggests that the multiple words for sin, pesha, atat, iniq um, of own iniquity, transgression, sin, um, suggests that, that anybody who reads or hears can name their own specifics, okay? Um, and that human beings, we can only confess the dirt of our sins, but it's God alone who's blameless in judgment is the one who can offer grace and a good soaking bath that will restore the one praying to a clean bill of health. Okay, I think that's all I was trying to get in here. Um, and then finally, the uh, God's cleansing requires um, a response to sing and to praise, which. Um, outline in, in verses 13 through 15. Okay, so finally, here it is. You got homework this week. All right, so now we've, we've talked about three types of Psalms. We've talked about a hymn of praise. We've talked about Thanksgiving hymn, and we talked about an individual lament. So what I want for you to do between now and next Wednesday, is I want you to take a look at these three Psalms, Psalm 148, I'm excuse me, 149, 138, and 13. Um, they are no longer than uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of six to nine verses. The, the, the longest one is nine verses. I think the shortest one is like six or seven verses. So they're short. And what I want you to do is to one, define the genre. So is either gonna be a hymn, a hymn of praise, a Thanksgiving hymn, or an individual lament. I want to see if you can chart the structure. So we, when we talk about the the uh, the Thanksgiving hymn and the hymn of praise, the call to worship, the reason or reasons to pray God, praise God, the concluding call to worship. What verses make up that structure? Um, likewise, 
Um, when you get these slides, you'll have the structure of the individual lament. See if you can identify where the uh, address to God is, where the complaint is, where the um, where the the uh, the confession of trust is, or the vow to praise God. See if you can identify uh, any motivations or um, where the assurance of being heard is. And then finally, uh, write a short prayer based on a verse, an image, God's character, or the structure of the psalm. Um, it may sound like a lot. You can do, if you do, uh, if you take one day over the next seven and do one psalm, you can do this in probably less than 30 minutes with each one. So again, I'll email you these slides so you have it, but that's homework. Um, see what you can do to see, you know, how this is uh, registering and staying with you. All right. Um, any last questions before we close with a word of prayer? Okay, hearing none, uh, let's, let me say thank you all so much for your presence, your participation on the night. I know we're a little long. I was trying to get it all in there. Uh, let us pray. God, we thank you for this time of sharing, this time that we've spent together uh, with your word, particularly Psalm 51, uh, that deals with an individual who has sinned and reminds us of the times in our lives when we have or we will sin, uh, do something that goes against your will, your standard, where we will miss the mark, God. And this psalm gives us hope that, that with you, God, that there is love, that there is forgiveness, that there is compassion. If we will but confess our sins, to, to be vulnerable, God, to name what it is that we've done that's gone against your word and to trust God that because of the work of Jesus, because you are a gracious God, because you are a God of unfailing love and compassion, that you will forgive us, that you can restore us, that you can restore our joy, that you can cleanse us inwardly and outwardly that that your forgiveness is complete so god help us to remember these words of the psalm writer to have when we sin holy spirit bring to our memory psalm 51 where we will ask you to have mercy upon us to have mercy upon us for we've sinned to have mercy upon us according to your merciful love, according to your great compassion, to blot out our transgressions. God, as we depart from one another's presence and from this time we've shared together, let this, uh, this time bear fruit in our lives. And may we go uh, forward ready to lay our heads on the pillow with the, these reassuring words. We can both lie down and sleep in peace that we can awake again on tomorrow because you are the one who sustains us. So God, we trust that you will sustain us through the darkness of night to wake us, to send us forward uh, with the gift of a brand new day of life on a brand new day. This we pray God in the name of our redeemer, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen.